In our previous video, we looked at the rise of neoclassicism in Italy during the Renaissance. Tonight, we want to take a, a step forward and look at France during the neoclassical era. This is late 1500s up till about 1700 in France. The Middle Ages uh, and the traditions of theater in the Middle Ages continued in France well up until the end of the 16th century. Renaissance thinking began in France with the reign of Henri II and his wife, Catherine de' Medici. This is a very natural development. I mean, the Medicis are the ruling family in Florence. They're one of the most prominent families in Europe. Now, through marriage, they have been connected with the monarchy in France. It's only logical that when Catherine de' Medici comes to France, she brings with her the thinking and the arts and the... Uh, new ideas that are flourishing in her homeland. By 1550, a group of seven writers, uh, led by Pierre Rosnard, uh, known as the Pleiade, had arisen in France due to the teachings and the ideas of uh, Italian thinkers that had followed uh, Catherine de' Medici to France. Uh, and the Pleiade are noted for a number of literary achievements. First, they sought to develop French as the medium for a literature modeled on classical works. They sought to formulate rules of grammar and prosody. They enriched the language by inventing new words, and they illustrated their ideals through the, their own literary works by creating uh, literature that demonstrated what they were talking about. In fact, the first plays written in French uh, were pieces based on classical forms written by the French playwright Etienne Jodel, who was a member of the Pleiade. Uh, he wrote Cleopatra Captive and Eugene in 1552, and there were many others to follow. Now, the plays that they were writing were classical in form, but they were more medieval in their subject matter. Tragedies typically were based on uh, classical themes or biblical subjects. Uh, comedies were uh, usually based on urban, amoral, middle-class characters who were motivated primarily by sex and the acquisition of more money. Now, Jardel, other members of the Pleiade, other literary figures in France were uh, involved in writing these neoclassical dramas, but it's important to bear in mind that these were not the entertainments that were most common. These were the the very highbrow, very literary entertainments of the day. Um, just like across most of Europe, uh, the most popular entertainments were um, very, very uh, visual, very spectacle-oriented um, entertainments. In Italy, they were being called intermezzi. In England, they were court masks. Here in France, they are called ballet du cour. The ballet du cour is just another example uh, in, in the same vein of the intermezzi, the court masks. It's a high spectacle, high, um, high profile entertainment with lots of visual effects and lots of uh, beautiful costumes and scenery. During this era, the public theaters of France were at low ebb uh, because of a monopoly that was in, in force that allowed all uh, theatrical production in Paris to be controlled by the Confrérie de la Passion. The Confrérie was basically a religious fraternity, uh, and they had been given... Uh, sole production rights within the city of Paris. Um, in the 1540s, they built the first permanent theater to be built on the European continent since the days of Rome uh, with the building of the Hotel de Bourgogne. The Hotel de Bourgogne was completed by the Confrérie de la Passion in 1548. Uh, it was produced for the production of religious plays. The only problem was that this was in the middle of the struggle between uh, Protestantism and Catholicism in France, and just like Elizabeth does in England in, the, in her struggle with 
Catholicism, uh, the English monarchs think it a good idea to stop the production of all religious drama. Therefore, there is no purpose for the Confrérie de la Passion, and they've got this beautiful theater they've built that has nothing to, to be done in it because religious plays aren't done anymore. Therefore, they begin to rent the theater out to touring companies. If you are familiar with uh, Rostand's play, Cyrano de Bergerac, the first scene of the play takes place in the Hotel de Bourgogne, where Cyrano comes to break up a performance by an actor that has fallen on Cyrano's bad side. Um, and there's a very, very good description of the theater in the text. Um, typically, if, if you've seen the... Um, uh, Gerard Depardieu version that was filmed several years ago. Uh, you, you also see a good visual representation of what the Hotel de Bourgogne looked like. Uh, starting in the 1570s, the company began to rent it out to other companies. Now, it's important to understand they still held their monopoly. So, not everybody rented the Hotel de Bourgogne, but everybody had to pay a fee to the Confrérie de la Passion. Uh, and so, you know, if you're going to pay them anyway, you might as well use the, the state-of-the-art theater that they have at their disposal. And so it became a very common place for touring companies in Paris to perform. Now, as I've already said, this was a period of great religious struggle in France. Uh, the Protestant Huguenots... Uh, are struggling for their own uh, freedom to worship as they please. They are struggling against oppression by Catholicism. Um, this, this struggle reaches its peak in 1572 with the St. Bartholomew Day Massacre. Uh, the massacre began on August 23rd, 24th, 1572, um, and would last several weeks and spread over much of France with a death toll of anywhere between 5,000 and 30,000 reported. Um, the important thing about the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre is that it eventually led to the Edict of Nantes, which provided uh, some degree of religious freedom uh, in France. In 1597, um, the Confrérie de la Passion finally gave up their monopoly. They dropped out of any kind of active involvement with theatrical production, which led to the um, led to the possibility of a professional production company arising in Paris. Up until that point, everything had to go through the Confrérie, uh, but now there was the option for somebody to operate independently. And it is at this time that Alexandre Hardy, uh, Alexander Hardy, uh, makes his appearance in France and um, fills that vacuum. Hardy reclaim, claims to have written over 500 plays, uh, but of those, only 34 still survive today. Uh, and he was a writer for the masses. He was appealing to the most, uh, the most common denominator of, of dramatic taste. And um, uh, he wasn't a great playwright. Um, he f followed the neoclassical form in that he wrote with five acts. Uh, and used messengers and confidants to get information um, uh, revealed on stage. But he did not observe the unities. He was, uh, he kept all of the action on stage, no matter how violent or how brutal. Uh, so he wasn't observing the, the, the neoclassical ideal of decorum. Um, and so he is a neoclassical playwright with a very popular bent. Um, he wrote for a, a company of actors, uh, called the Comédien de Roi, the, or the Comedians of the King. Apparently, apparently their claim to fame had been that they once performed in front of, um, the King. Uh, their title was not a, a, uh, indication of royal patronage. It was a company that was always in financial trouble, always reorganizing, always uh, disbanding and reforming. 
Um, it was a financially troubled company. In 1610, there were over 400 touring companies operating in France. Um, so these were small, often commercially dodgy enterprises that uh, that would reform and re uh, realign themselves depending on the popularity of individual actors and the success of the company. These 17th century acting companies were very, very similar to what we've already seen in England. They were uh, companies that were set up on the sharing plan. Uh, there were shareholders who each took a cut and then other actors who were uh, part of the company by contract. Uh, those players were typically bound together by two to three year contracts. Um, so you had hired, you had shareholders and hired men who formed the company. Unlike the English companies, the uh, French companies often had female company members to play young lovers. Uh, they still relied on uh, male comedians to play older female roles, but they did rely on young women to play the romantic female roles. These touring companies were. Um, highly influenced by the touring media companies that were very, very popular in France. Um, and so many of the best known actors of the day made their career, made their name playing stock characters uh, similar to those from the Comédia. Uh, those included uh, Gros Guillaume, or Fat Bill, uh, a role made famous by the actor Robert Guérin, uh, Gaultier Gargui, uh, that was played by Hugh Garou, and Terlupin, who was played by Henri Legrand. Uh, and as we'll see later on in this, um, this module, uh, the Commedia dell'arte, or the Commedia Italiana, had a huge impact on French theater. Uh, whether it was the formation and the makeup of companies and uh, characters like these we've just mentioned, or uh, the plot developments of uh, playwrights like uh, Moliere. There was a huge influence scene from the Comédie. As these touring companies began to become more successful and began to build their own spaces, um, architects naturally looked to the Hotel de Bourgogne. It was the first permanent theater built in France built in Europe since the Classical Age, and it was only um, only fitting that they should use it as a model for theaters to be built. Let's look at the physical dimensions of the Hotel de Bourgogne, uh, because it will give us some idea of the other theaters being built during this era. Um, the hotel was a, pr approximately 40 feet wide, and 105 feet long. The first floor was a pit or a parterre. Uh, it was comparable to the um, the open space for the groundlings in the uh, Elizabethan theater, except it would typically have uh, bench seating available. Um, there were two to three galleries that were divided into boxes. Uh, the first gallery was an undivided amphitheater it could seat approximately 1,600 people. The stage was raised approximately six feet, and it was the entire width of the building, but uh, probably only about 25 feet of it was uh, was visible space. Uh, sight lines were caused, sight line issues uh, made part of it unusable. Uh, the depth of the of stage ranged from 17 to 35 feet. We're not as not as precise on the depth of the stage. This became a, a common model, a common uh, footprint for theaters built during this era. Luckily, theater companies kept a pretty accurate record of what monies were spent, and so not only do we have a very complete record of the dimensions of the Hotel de Bourgogne, but we also have a pretty good indication of what scenic practices were at the Hotel de Bourgogne and other theaters because of records kept by the theaters themselves. Um, this is kind of a summary of what we know about scenic practices in France from 1595 to 1629.
First of all, we believe that the Colin Ferrari may have owned their own scenery uh, because they rented out the building so frequently uh, they might very well have been renting scenery um, along with the space. Uh, the records of the Comédien du Roi, the uh, company that Alexandre Hardy wrote for, uh, shows in their records that they, paint, they paid their scene pa that they paid money to scene painters to create scenery for them. Uh, we know that Hardy's plays require from three to seven locations, and that they were frequently done with mansion-style uh, uh, scenery, like you would expect in a, a medieval mystery play. Um, any extant illustrations we have of theater productions from the period show a compartmentalized stage with two compartments on either side and a curtain in the center that was very similar to the Terentian stage uh, that appeared in the Italian Renaissance and the stage used by the Chambers of Rhetoric during the Middle Ages. Um, and we do know that since most theater companies were itinerant and didn't have the benefit of their own touring, uh, their own performing space, there was probably very little uh, attempt at, uh, at lavish scenery. Uh, so things were kept pretty simple. We also know that there was a very common uh, alternative space that was available to touring companies who could not afford the use of the hotel to Burgonia. Um, when a th rental theater was not available, um, theater artists of this day turned to the indoor tennis courts that were common in France during this era. When you compare the size of these uh, tennis courts with the Hotel de Bourgogne, it becomes obvious quickly why these spaces were chosen. Now, if you look at the Hotel de Bourgogne, it was 105 feet long by 40 feet wide. If you look at a tennis court in, in neoclassical France, it is 90 feet long by 30 feet wide, about 10 feet off uh, on both the length and the width. Uh, there were galleries uh, already built above the tennis courts for observers. Above those galleries were windows that would allow in illumination to light the performance. The only thing that had to be done to make a tennis court uh, an adequate performance space was to build a raised stage at one end and then bring in the seating, bring in benches or chairs or whatever was going to be used. In 1610, Louis XIII came to the throne of France. His chief minister was Cardinal Richelieu. Under Richelieu's leadership, a new sense of security and stability returned to France. With that stability came a renewed interest in the arts, literature, and court spectacle. This led to a resurgence of the neo neoclassical ideal in writing. This era is of particular interest to me because I just got finished living there. Uh, as I told you guys in my explanation of why we're a little behind in getting lectures posted this week, I just finished a production of The Three Musketeers, set in 1627 during the reign of Louis XIII, and I, of course, played Cardinal Richelieu. Uh, here's a picture of me with my... Uh, my assistant and uh, partner in intrigue, Milady de Winter. Near the end of Louis XIII's reign, uh, in 1636-37, uh, Pierre Cornet wrote a play entitled Le Cid. Le Cid started one of the greatest literary controversies of all time um, and uh, had to be arbitrated by a body of... Um, scholars called the French Academy uh, to try to come to some uh, resolution. Uh, Le Cid was controversial for many reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, it observed the unities, but it stretched verisimilitude beyond any belief by crowding so many events um, into one 24-hour period, including a complete war from start to finish. Um, the heroine of Le Cid agrees to marry the man who killed her father, which uh, completely 
completely uh, blows away the uh, neoclassical ideal of decorum and appropriate behavior. Uh, finally, the play seemed to fit into no category. It, uh, it had elements of tragicomedy, pastoral, uh, and comedy. It was just, it, it wasn't of a clear genre. The French have always taken their literary debates very seriously. Uh, you'll see again when we get to the Romantic era with Victor Hugo's Air Nani. Uh, again, they broke into riots that had to be resolved. In this case, Richelieu, the, the cardinal and first minister to the king, uh, requires the French Academy to convene and to examine Le Cid and to try to make some decision about whether it was um, inappropriate or not. Uh, in typical bureaucratic fashion, the French Academy, after a year-long debate over the quality of Le Cid, uh, finally came down to the decision that some parts were appropriately neoclassical and others weren't. It praised the play in places that it met neoclassical standards. It criticized the play in areas where it deviated from neoclassical standards. In other words, they really didn't accomplish anything. But Richelieu was still a man of great influence. Um, in the 1640s, he attracted Italianate scenic practices to France, and he built one of the first theaters in France designed to accommodate it. In 1640, as a part of his own palace, uh, Cardinal Richelieu premieres a theater or, or opens a theater that he has called the Palais Cardinal. Um, and he opens it with a lavish Italianate uh, spectacle entitled Mirame. Uh, regretfully, Richelieu dies the next year, and so the Palais Cardinal goes to the king and becomes the Palais Royal. Now, of course, the king by 1640 is no longer Louis XIII, it is Louis XIV, Le Roi du Soleil, the Sun King. In a unique display of how history can shape art and art can shape history. Young Louis XIV, uh, who comes to the throne at the age of five in 1643, and who by 1653 is now 15 years old, dances in a, a ballet d'entrée, a, a very uh, highly spectacalized uh, ballet filled with beautiful scenery and lavish costumes. Um, and this particular um, ballet d'entrée was entitled the Ballet of the Night. Uh, Louis, the Louis the Fourteenth uh, dances the part of the sun, um, the heavenly body, the sun. And this new king, who is trying to define himself after the very successful reign <clears throat> of his father, Louis the Thirteenth, uh, finds in this image of the sun the defining image of his reign, and he, that is how he becomes Le Roi du Soleil, the Sun King. Richelieu's successor as First Minister of France uh, was Cardinal Mazarin. Now Mazarin was Italian. Uh, and his chief love was opera. And so opera was getting a huge boost in the French theaters uh, during the late reign of Louis XIII, the early reign of Louis XIV. Finally, a commedia troupe that was uh, in residence at that point in Paris goes to the queen and says, we've got to have help. Uh, we're, we're a French comedia company. We're not getting the attention we need because all the, all the attention is being given to Italian opera. Please help us compete. And so the Queen sends to Italy and uh, commissions a, an Italian scene designer to come and produce scenery for this comedia company. Uh, the, person, person, she, the person she chooses or who answers her request is the famous scenographer Giacomo Torelli, who was famous for the invention of uh, chariot and pole uh, scene shifting or, 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 or scene design. And so Giacomo Torelli comes to France in the 
um, 1650s and uh, establishes Italian scenic practices in the French theaters. Louis' favorite form of entertainment was comédie ballet, which was a blending of comic dialogue uh, with interludes of um, ballet en trade, the allegorical ballets that uh, we've already talked about in which uh, Louis danced the role of the sun. Uh, and so there was a huge demand for these comedy ballet. Um, and so two, two artists uh, arose at court who began to fill these needs. Uh, one was the composer Jean-Baptiste Lully, uh, and the other was a, a young actor by the name of Jean-Baptiste Poquelin or Moliere. And together they began to create these comedy ballet to entertain the king. Now, Lully is credited with the development of French opera um, during the uh, 1670s and 1680s. He began to create operatic pieces that would define what French opera would be, and was even credited with founding the Opéra, the the theater specifically designated for the performance of these musical dramas. Lully has one of those uh, death stories that you find frequently in theater, a very unique way of dying. Apparently, in the 17th century, it was common for the conductor not to wave a very small baton to keep the orchestra together, but to hold in his hand a very large baton that was a stick that he would pound to keep the music going in time. Uh, Lully apparently hit his own toe with his baton and uh, broke it. And would, because he didn't seek treatment for the, for the break, um, it became gangrenous. The gangrene spread and he died of blood poisoning. Um, so if you stub your toe or hit it with a big stick, please make sure you seek medical assistance. There are two great playwrights that come from this era. We've already mentioned one, Moliere. The other is Jean Racine. Uh, Racine was originally a protege of Moliere's. Racine was highly educated and was a great admirer of classical drama. His first play, La Thebade, was produced by Moliere and was a financial flop. Uh, but despite this, Moliere saw something that he um, that he respected in the young playwright, and he agreed to produce his second play, Alexander the Great. Now, Alexander the Great was a bit more successful, but Racine was still not satisfied with the production it received. And so after two weeks of running at Moliere's theater, um, Racine went to another playwright or another production company in Paris and offered them the rights to the play, basically snatching it out from under Moliere. In addition to that, he persuaded um, Mademoiselle du Parc, the leading lady of Moliere's company, to go with him to this other rival production company. Uh, and Moliere never forgave Racine for the for the insult, for the um, for the stab in the back. Racine's greatest work is generally considered to be his Phaedra. Um, it was said at the time that Racine was able to make simple plots with complex characters, as compared to Corneille, the, the playwright who wrote Le Cid, who was noted for creating simple, complex plots with very simple characters. Um, Racine was noted for, for, for building his plays on the inner psychological struggles of his characters, and therefore is considered uh, the better of the two playwright, Corneille or um, Racine. But when you're talking about playwrights of the neoclassical French stage, uh, the most important is obviously Moliere. Moliere was the son of the royal upholsterer, which means he was of uh, uh, a court 
position. He, he was nobility. He received a, an outstanding education and was, designed, was destined for a position in court him, at court himself. Uh, however, in 1643, he left that life to pursue the life of an actor and joined a theater troupe called Teatro Illustre. Um, by 1651, he was the head of that company. Uh, he went on to become the playwright, and in 1659, his play La Precieuse Ridicule uh, was a huge hit, and the company's future was made. Uh, they were given use of the Palais Royal, and eventually became the king's uh, troop with royal patronage. Um, Moliere was a personal friend of Louis XIV, which, as we'll see in just a few minutes, uh, was a very critical factor in his uh, receiving Christian burial. Moliere always had a very troubled relationship with the church. Um, perhaps his most famous play is the play Tartuffe. Uh, Tartuffe is a play that... Um, pokes fun at religious hypocrisy, and because of that, drew the ire of the church. Um, uh, the play had to be rewritten a number of times to try to get past censorship that was imposed upon it because of uh, its religious nature. Um, it, again, finally came down to the intervention of King Louis XIV himself to uh, get the play seen. Um, Moliere did seem to bring some of this disrespect from the church upon himself. There is a story that is told. Um, it's one of those historical enigmas. Uh, when he first joined the Teatro Illustra, Illustra, he was in love with the leading lady of that company. Um, Twenty years later, he marries that leading lady's daughter. There is speculation that he might have even married his own daughter. And so uh, that's one of those unprovable uh, speculative conspiracy theories um, that you find in theater history from time to time. Uh, but there was some questionable uh, practices in Moliere's, uh, in Moliere's life and career. Moliere dies in 1673. In fact, uh, he dies on stage or, or shortly thereafter. He gets sick during a performance um, with a coughing fit. Um, and after the performance, dies of, of uh, some kind of hemorrhage or, or lung-related accident. Um, because he is an actor... He is denied burial in holy ground. Uh, he is denied the sacraments of the church. It finally falls to intervention from Louis XIV to go to the church and say, this is a personal friend of mine. You need to give him proper burial. Uh, the church finally conceded and allowed Moliere to be buried on sacred ground with the understanding that the, the burial would take place at night and would not be attended uh, or would not be accompanied by a church service. Um, on Moliere's death, there were five theater companies uh, struggling to survive in Paris. Uh, under orders of King Louis XIV in, 19, in 1680, those companies all merged and became the Comédie Française, um, the first national theater company.